Um, can I just check, first of all, so in terms of the audience, hands up, who's, who's been in virtual reality in any form? It's about half of you, I'd say. Okay, and again, show of hands, who, as they sit here right now, expects to be using virtual reality for training in some way or rehearsal in the next five years? So a few more. Okay, that's interesting. Um, one other show of hands, if I may. Um, who's been in a simulation centre practising this year? Most of you work in them, so that's a bit of a loaded question. But, but that's great, that's great. When I go around the world and talk to a lot of different hospitals uh, across multi-disciplines, what I hear a lot is not much frequency when it comes to being in the simulation centre. And you guys deal with it on a daily basis. You, you know the challenges there. They're expensive. They are um, often geographically located away from where most people are on a day-to-day -day basis. They aren't open all day long and all night long. So they don't fit with work patterns, etc. necessarily. So the topic of my talk, talk is about freedom and about trying to break out of the simulation center. That's not to say that simulation centers aren't great. They are. They're fantastic. And to your question earlier um, at the back, um, I'm very much a believer in, in multimodal training. So I see virtual reality training, or for virtual reality, read immersive technology, because whether it's VR, AR, MR, that's just a technology bent at the moment. You know, for immersive technology, I see that as part of this type of multimodal uh, training environment that you are operating in and will continue to operating in, operate in. And it offers some opportunities within that space. So I just wanted to explore that for a moment and just kind of go, well, what, what, what is there? There's a whole, I'll just back up one sec. There's a whole raft of things and you've probably got others as well. I'm not saying this is an exhaustive list, but you know, from, and the surgeons I talk to often talk about the, the, the value of anecdote and storytelling and, and understanding what happened within a surgical environment because of the story that I was able to impart, the kind of the apprentice uh, 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 download. There's that, so colleagues, observation of colleagues, talking to colleagues, listening to colleagues. There's being in the real OR itself, of course. There's lots of literature that you have and will and continue to study. Uh, going to the top, there's cadaveric training, which is uh, invaluable, but uh, has a number of, uh, of issues related to it in terms of its uh, operational uh, use. Uh, there's, of course, mannequins. We saw a great picture of one in the last presentation. Uh, uh, they, they have a great role to uh, play as well, as does role play simulation. You know, uh, sim managers and sim centers um, are essential. You know, there's some great equipment in there, but it's often stuck in that one location and, and it's hard for people to access. There's virtual reality, immersive technology and all of that stuff and then there's YouTube which is always the one that really scares me when you, you Google how many surgical procedures are now on YouTube. The last time I did it I had 187,000 um, come up. Some really great stuff but some other stuff that maybe shouldn't be the, the source of knowledge. Um, Anyway, as we look at that, you know, all of those can deliver cognitive understanding. Uh, some of them can deliver understanding and, and, and uh, um, education around your effectors and your, your psychomotor skills. Um, some of them have risk attached to it, so we start to knock out things like the real OR. It's, it's undoubtedly the primary training location for surgery, but it's ne not necessarily a low-risk environment to operate within, um, for all the reasons that you will know better than I. In terms of repetition, you know, lessons come from repetition, exposure, having opportunities to repeat, try again and again and again. There are only a few places where you can really do that on a, on a regular basis that is low cost, uh, sorry, uh, low risk. So again, we start to knock some of these out. Um, in terms of data around what have you actually done, you know, questionable in some, some areas where, whether there's real data that you can draw and, and uh, uh, have objectively recorded and maintained to start to build up a record of someone's real ability. Frequency is an issue. Like I said, Sim Center is fantastic. There's some amazing simulation uh, uh, equipment out there already. The, the, the role play environments are fantastic. But what I hear from most clinicians is they can't get in there most of the time. Um, no. St. Mary's is a great example, uh, just because it's not this location, I'll use that one as an example. You know, fantastic Simpson, although I hear it's about to shut down. Um, and uh, it's in a different building, you need a different pass for it. 
at your average surgeon or clinician is not going to be able to get access to that without a lot of pre-planning. Um, the ability to just go, I need to just rehearse, I need to tune up, I need to just practice, it's just not there at the moment. So, in my view, this is the challenge that we really face and the one that we're trying to address at Fundamental VR. And that is that, you know, of the 1.5 million roughly worldwide surgeons that are out there, 300,000 or so in training, we estimate that less than half of 1% of them have a day-to-day -day access to any sort of environment where they can practice safely. And we think that's a, 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 a situation that need, we need to change. Now, again, we didn't invent simulation. Uh, there are lots of simulators out there, but the challenges with those simulations are that the existing ones are really expensive. You know, there's some great, great machines, but they come with a heavy capital investment, quite a heavy ongoing investment. They require a dedicated room. They probably require a sim center manager or, or a sim tech to run them. They're, they're hard to get up and running. I'm generalizing, but in, in, in broad terms. The cost-effective ones are often disappointingly unrealistic. So they have a role, they do a job, absolutely. You know, a box trainer is a great, great thing, but it, it can only go so far. And all of them have an issue with objective measurement. You know, again, some of the, the high-end simulators have definitely got this in place, but in terms of real, true objective measurement that is always there, it's hard to, to see that, that run through. So that's really where we come from, uh, a start from, and that, that our, our company is called Fundamental VR, our product is called Fundamental Surgery. There's a couple of instances of it over there, and I would encourage you all, it'll be here all day, so in any of the breaks, please do come in and, and engage with my team and, and, and me and you know, have a go on it, because there's nothing like hands-on experience. But our mission with Fundamental Surgery is this, it's all about trying to democratize surgical training, trying to put it within arm's reach of you guys, so that you can have a safe, repeatable place where you can measure your skills, your capability, and practice, rehearse, and learn. It looks like that. It looks like that. Um, as I said, it's about being safe. It's about being repeatable. You know, one of our simulations is a um, uh, pedicle screw trainer. You, know, you can start at the very top of the spine, and you can go to the very bottom of the spine, and you can try and practice and rehearse the angles, depth, and, and approach for a pedicle screw, screw placement into every single vertebra. And when you get one wrong, you can just reset and go again. You can do three, you can do all of them. It's entirely up to you, and you can spend as long as you want in there. And it measures every movement, as the previous speaker was talking about. Yeah, we know exactly what you're looking at, so we can measure how much you're looking at the surgical site. There are serious validation studies that prove the impact of looking at the surgical site all the time. You know, we can know exactly what you're doing with your hands, because we have haptic devices that allow you to interact. So we can talk about efficiency of movement. We know exactly what you're doing, therefore we can talk about and measure the exact patient outcome against our parameters. So we can give you real hard data about performance. And it's scalable because all of that hardware that you see over there is off the shelf. It, with the exception of the haptic arms, which are these devices here, which provide the sense of touch, so you're not just seeing this, you're not just in the operating theatre, you are feeling the patient anatomy, you are interacting with the tissue, it is reacting to what you do. All of that hardware is available from Dixon's, with the exception of this haptic device here which is available globally. And all of that hardware is probably going to cost you £6,000. So it's a dramatically low cost, and that's why we believe it's really scalable. Um, I'm going to run a little video that just shows a little bit of this. Hopefully, we'll have some sound on it. And hopefully, it will run. Let's see. Ah. Oh, there's probably a question. I thought I had spinal surgery training in orthopedic. Uh, neurosurgical spinal procedures. My main focus is on complex reconstructive procedures of the entire spine involving tubes and quality. And in this field, I'm very much aware of the technical complexities and the long working hours and many years it requires to train to become proficient in these different techniques. Training in the job of these kind of techniques is pretty much like going into a new musician and going and learning to play an instrument during a concert. When looking at complex reconstructive spinal procedure, the cornerstone really is the pedicle screws, so how to insert the implants into the spine with what fundamental can offer. We can recreate 
the specific tactile feel of passing through the pedicle, the angles, we can credit those so that the muscle memory and all these subconscious learning effects is there. The same as a musician learns chords and scales and after a time this becomes intuitive and you no longer need to think about what you're doing. This is the last thing that people learn because it's the most difficult and it's one which the least time and it's one which has the greatest hazards. And it's, it's exciting developments like the developing our simulation which now actually allow us to develop tools for this kind of training to fill this gap. So that's a little bit of the platform and in action, it's always good to see it. Again, I encourage you to have a go because there is nothing, until, until you feel a virtual patient, you, you'll be going, well, yeah, it's, it's kind of fine, but you need to try it, trust me. It, it's, it, I encourage you all to have a go with it. Um, so just sort of breaking it down a little bit and explaining a little bit about what we're doing behind this. Of course, you know, this, this is not what you see. What you see is the environment that you started to see uh, within that video. Um, the, system is built up of very high resolution graphics so our uh, approach on hardware is to be plug and play so we support all the mainstream VR headsets most of them are below 2k at the moment there will be 4 and 8k machine uh, devices that come through so the resolution just gets better we build to the highest end we can right now um, this is the sort of standard it's at today and again, to our previous speaker's note, you know, we're probably on step one of a 20-stage process, so we've got a long way to go with this still, but it's good enough fidelity, and it's at a high enough resolution, and it's, it's anatomically correct to the level that you can rely on it as a training tool. Our validation studies are proving this. Uh, you, have, you have things such as virtual x-ray. So you know, learning how to use an x-ray, how to use a C-arm, etc., is difficult, cumbersome, can involve lots of different uh, requirements. And of course, there's, a, there's, there's an exposure issue around that. So learning in a virtual space as part of one of our procedures is a really interesting way of approaching it. Um, as you go through all of these different graphics, the, uh, the different elements, the, the haptic intelligence that we've built that runs into those devices, but again, we're plug and play, so there are haptic gloves coming through at the moment. They won't be in production for another, in terms of commercially viable, for probably another year or so, but our haptic intelligence engine will work with those devices as it comes through. So it means as you pick up whatever the instrument is and apply it to the, to the patient, it will behave the way you want it to, and you can feel that within the environment there. Um, so that if it's a saw, whether it's a retractor, whether it's a scalpel, it will have those different behaviours. You will believe it because your mind is amazing at filling in the gaps when you're in the VR space around uh, what you're holding. It will see, you'll see it, it will feel the same, and it will work through those different interfaces that, that are there. Which also, by the way, we can plug off the back of them and put extra elements on. So if you actually want to hold a drill handle, we can do that. You'll have guessed we're focused on orthopaedic at the moment. Um, so the haptic intelligence engine is a really key part of what we do and the only way that gets better is by working with clinicians uh, because it's all about the calibration system that we've built to get to the point where we can say this is what that type of tissue behaves like in that type of environment under those type of conditions when you do that to it. So we have a calibration system that allows us to really uh, get to that. Um, it's low cost hardware as I mentioned, uh, dramatically low cost compared to any simulation uh, system that's out there at the moment where you're normally talking about a computer-based system with a hundred eighty to hundred thousand pound capital investment we're talking about a capital investment of maybe eight to nine um, and then there's all the data and the data is a really key part here so as a previous speaker mentioned you know the 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 users of this are highly engaged with it because it's a completely new way of, of, you, of, of learning. Um, there's a novelty factor there, but there's also just an effector uh, that's co coming through. Uh, there's real-time assessment in everything. So when we say you need to cut three millimeters or you need to insert half a centimeter, whatever, whatever the things is, we can measure every one of those elements precisely and immediately tell you whether you've done it right or wrong. So you can immediately adjust and try again or keep rolling through. And we provide a multi-user dashboard, which means that you get to keep a record of everything you're doing and how you're improving or not. At a cohort level, you get to see how everyone's performing against each other. At a trust level, you get to see how everyone's performing against each other. It's kind of lots of levels to the data. 
And this is again some illustrations of that. So you can see here there's an assessment metric up here that's around, I think, a dummy a pedicle screw case where it's looking at what you've done, where you've done, it, done things successfully and not, how much time you spent looking at the surgical site, 68%. You were looking elsewhere for a third of the time. Uh, how many x-rays you're taking, we were snapping away with this one, 38 in, the, in this particular case. Down here at the bottom right, you can see here against a specific, again this is pedicle screw, a specific uh, uh, vertebra how this particular user has done against the angle objectives that they had to uh, uh, deliver on. Uh, and then some background patient case information here as well that just kind of brings that, that together. But the point of this isn't just to go, isn't that great? And, and isn't it nice to know straight away how good or bad you're doing against these measures? That is useful. But more than that, um, this chap, um, William Denning, said, in, well, you can read it, in God we trust and everyone else needs to bring data. You know, data is everything, as you well know, and you're recording it in lots of different ways. What we're able to do with our system is start to record in the surgical uh, context all the key metrics around our simulation. It's not the same as the real world. Back to my start point, it sits in a multimodal uh, environment. But in our environment, we can control all of these different elements around how you're performing within a procedure, whether you spend five minutes in there or five hours in there. We can start to build up a dashboard, as I mentioned, that starts to look at capability, it starts to look at frequency, and it starts to look at recency. You know, it starts to say, well, you know, how often have you done this, and when did you do it, and when, how did you perform within it, and is that good, bad, or, or, or not? And, and Again, it's not for us to judge it, it's just to report it, and we can provide that information. Which allows you to start to do things like this, which is to start to say, okay, well, there's a distribution curve of expected capability for any procedure, doesn't matter what it is, um, across different skills level, and there's how my, uh, my individuals within my training program are sitting right now, based on all the things that they've done. You start to say, well, you know, we've got some people here, immediately we can identify that we need to go back and look at what, what they're doing to get to this point, either above or below the line. And we can take it down to the individual step. It's like, well, actually, Richard, it's when you're doing your posterior um, hip replacement, it's when you go in to do the particular uh, stage, fourth, fourth level in, you're just taking it, you're approaching it in the wrong way and every time the acetabular is having an issue as a result of that and that's why you're having challenges with this particular procedure. It provides another data point that's empiric. Why is that important? Well, our first speaker this morning talked about um, aviation a lot, so I was pleased to kind of drop back to aviation. So um, this is an F-18 landing on some boat somewhere, some ship. Um, so I work with the Cleveland Clinic, and the, the guy who heads simulation there is actually an ex-Top Gun fighter pilot, and he told me this stat. They got to the point in the US Navy where they knew that if you hadn't landed this plane on this ship within six days, or been in a simulation, your chances of crashing that plane onto that ship significantly increased. So they would take you off that ship and put you in simulation if you passed the six days, which is obviously a really expensive thing to do. So making sure that people were, their recency and their frequency and their capability was measured was really, really important. And having that dashboard that allows you to go, well, where does it sit, could be really valuable really valuable when you look at things like this. Again, we had some of these numbers before. These are just some of the ones I, I pulled out. So 2016, 6,000 incidents of surgical mishap. Uh, compensation, 1.4 billion here in the UK. Um, it, it went down slightly in 2017, actually. Um, I should put those figures up. I think it was 1.3 in 2017. Um, again, people argue the numbers. These, this is fact. This is, this is what was paid out. Uh, according to NHS Digital in relation to these errors. So anything that mitigates some of that has got to be a great thing. But more than that, the impact, again, back to the airline industry, um, I think United Airlines actually, there was an incident over Portland back in the 80s, which I think was the start of a lot of the things that Niall was talking about this morning. But um, this is picking up a point he made earlier. So United Airlines uh, 747, I don't guess many of those are flying today, but in the US, According to that John Hopkins report that was referenced this morning, two of these are falling out of the sky every day because of medical error. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that our system or our approach is going to solve all those problems, but it gives you absolute data, it gives you absolute frequency, it gives it to you at low cost, and it puts it right, if you want, next to the clinical environment. UCLH have their version of our system now sitting between the two ORs, so that it's there to be used when you want to use it, not that you need to book into it. Um, and that's about it really. Again, I would encourage you to, if you get a chance, to, to try this while it's here. We would love to have your feedback on it. It's not perfect. There are always improvements and it doesn't necessarily do it exactly the way you want to do it. But if there's any orthopedics here, you know, we've got knee, we've got hips, both, both flavours are hip. We've got, uh, what else have we got? Oh, actually, we don't think we've got hip in there, have we? No, we haven't got hip in there. We've got knee and we've got uh, a, 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 a pedicle screw placement for you to try and I would love for you to uh, give that a go and please give us any feedback you've got on it. Um, that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs>